Hi everyone, my name is Evan Orticio and I'm currently an incoming first year PhD student at UC Berkeley, but today I'll be presenting work I did at Swarthmore College alongside Stella Christie, who is now at Tsinghua University. And the topic of the talk is an object bias that disrupts rule-based generalization in adults across domains. So humans are expert pattern detectors. We are constantly tracking co-occurrences and frequencies and noticing different patterns in our world. And one of the most fundamental pattern recognition mechanisms that we have at our disposal is abstract rule learning. This is the ability to learn and to generalize high level abstract patterns from input. And it's implicated in a bunch of really important things like language acquisition and mathematical reasoning. Now we know abstract rule learning is a robust mechanism from infancy. Um, from Marcus et al. seminal work, we know that seven month old infants are able to learn and generalize simple ABA or ABB patterns of syllables from just two minutes of exposure. And we also know that this is a domain general mechanism. By even younger ages, like three months of age, infants can learn simple patterns of shapes and even more complex objects like dogs, for example. So we know we have this ability, but how does rule learning work in the real world? We know that the world is infinitely rich with structure. In fact, it probably has more structure than we're able to be aware of at any given time. So what kinds of things constrain what is actually learned? Well, we know that the world is rich with structure, but it also has a bunch of other stuff. Take these sentences, for example. Priya bounces the ball, Maria kicks the ball, the boy kicks Maria, the ball hits a tree. In all these sentences, if you search for commonalities, there are plenty. One commonality that you might notice is that they all have similar structure. So they all follow the same subject, verb, object, word order. But of course, that's not the only information that is shared between these items. You might also notice that individual words are also repeated between the items. And it's important to note that while sometimes these two dimensions, structure and object identity, lead to the same mappings, sometimes they do not. For example, if you're analyzing these two sentences based on their structural similarity, you would match Maria, the subject, to the boy, the subject. But of course, if you're matching based on object identity, you make a different match from Maria to Maria, despite the fact that those two Marias occupy different syntactic roles. So there's clearly sometimes a conflict between abstract regularities on one hand and object-based identity matches on the other. And this isn't a new insight. We know from the analogy literature that the tension between relational structure on one hand and object identity on the other is strong. And like rule learning, analogy involves the abstraction of structure. But in that abstraction, sometimes the object match can be more salient. For example, in a relational match to sample task like this one, four-year-olds will choose the object match instead of the relational match 83% of the time. And adults are certainly not infallible either. We know that in a scene analogy task like this one, 40% of adults will match the woman in the top picture to the woman in the bottom picture instead of using the relational match, which would be to map the, the woman, the receiver, to the animal, the receiver. So here we ask whether object identity constrains rule learning just as it constrains analogy. In other words, will adults make rule-based generalizations in a rule learning task even in the presence of object similarity? To test this, we test adults on a traditional rule learning paradigm taken directly from Marcus et al. Except critically, we pit the rule match against an object match. And I'll discuss this a bit later. But essentially, we give our adults a goal-oriented task, which is to help a lost bunny named Bella find her family. And they can do so because every family of bunnies has its own song. So the familiarization phase consists of those songs. This is a two minute speech stream of three syllable strings that follow either an ABA or ABB pattern. And these are the same stimuli used in Marcus et al. Ga, la, ga. Li, ti, li. Ni, la, ni. And it continues like that. And after the familiarization, there are two conditions that participants are sorted into. In the rule only condition, we replicate the basic Marcus et al. rule learning task, where they have to generalize to new songs composed of completely novel syllables. One of the choices will be a rule match, so it follows the same pattern as heard in familiarization, like so. Whoa, duh, whoa. And the other option will have a different rule. Whoa, duh, duh. And in the object match condition, we have the same rule match. Whoa, duh, whoa. But the other option, the incongruent rule, features a syllable that was present during familiarization, like this. Whoa, la, la. So we're pitting the rule match against a simple perceptual match from one syllable 
to that of the familiarization stimuli. So our first main question is whether adults can generalize an abstract rule in general, and we find that this is indeed the case. Mapping the percentage of rule matches across all trials, we find that adults are performing at significantly above chance levels on the rule only condition. But what happens when there is a viable alternative option? So what happens when you have the rule available, but you also have simple object matches available as well? Here we find that object matches are actually the preferred basis of generalization for these participants. So when both kinds of generalizations are possible, adults largely forego the rule-based matches in favor of those simple object matches. So that's the group level behavior, but we're also interested in individual level behavior. So we sorted individuals into the three categories below. We have in green, the rule choosers who chose the rule match on at least seven of the eight trials. In red, you'll see the opposite choosers who chose the rule match on only zero or one of the trials. And yellow is more mixed behavior. So we find that in the control condition, the rule only condition, a good proportion of participants are, are consistently choosing that rule match. But in the object match condition, we find that a large majority, 75% of our participants are consistently choosing that object match instead of the abstract rule-based match. So is this object bias in rule learning domain general? To test this, we replicate experiment one, except we use shapes instead of syllables. And to make these two experiments as alignable as possible, we present the shapes in a way that is similar to the syllables. So they appear one at a time and with the same timing. So each shape lasts for the same duration as an average syllable in the first experiment. And like experiment one again, we have a rule only condition and an object match condition where crucially the incongruent rule in the object match condition contains one of the shapes that was seen throughout the familiarization stimuli. So in experiment two, we see that the general pattern holds, where in the rule only condition, adults are successful at generalizing based on the rule. But in the object match condition, when the object match is also a viable generalization strategy, we see that overall performance drops to at chance levels. So comparing across the two experiments, we do find one important difference, which is that the object match is a particularly strong basis for generalization in experiment one with syllables, whereas with shapes, it's a bit more mixed. And this is reflected also in the individual behavior, where we see that 76% of the participants in experiment one are consistently choosing that object match on all trials or almost all, whereas it's a bit more mixed again in experiment two. So to sum up so far, we find that across two domains, adults are able to generalize abstract rules when only in structural commonalities are available. But when both structural and object commonalities are options, adults often forego that rule abstraction in favor of the simple object matches. And object-based generalization is also particularly prevalent with the syllables. Um, and one hypothesis that we're currently exploring is whether syllables like la and ga are simply more meaningful as individual units than shapes like a purple square. And this might encourage the preference for that object similarity. So we do see this object bias across two different domains, but can this bias be overcome? Are both the structural commonalities and the object commonalities available at any given moment? In other words, can individual learners flexibly switch between choosing on the basis of structure and on the basis of object identity? So to test this, we replicate experiment one, but we essentially change the between subject manipulation to a within subjects manipulation. So in the test phase, we have a block of object match trials, and then it's directly followed by a rule only block where that object match is no longer an option. And so what we're really interested in is to see whether object choosers from the first block will switch and become rule choosers in that second block. So here are our results. This is graphing individual behavior in block one and how that flows into individual behavior in block two. And we're focusing on the object choosers. So can people that chose the object match consistently in block one switch to the rule in block two when it's only the rule versus a non rule? And what we find is that most of them are not able to switch to that rule. So 76% of them end up choosing at random in that second block, so they're basically lost, versus only 21% of them are able to consistently choose that rule. And remember, that is much lower than the rate at which people choose the rule in just the control conditions without this blocked format. So this is significant. Basically, once you choose that object match, it's difficult to switch, even when this is the only option. Um, and remember, it's a goal-oriented task, so it would be adaptable to switch if you have access to this rule representation. 
And so this inflexibility and in generalization strategy shows that this object bias is pretty strong. So we also wonder if this inflexibility works both ways. So if we instead start with the rule only block and then change to an object match block, will the same number of people be enticed by the object matches as in experiment one, or will people stick to that rule based match? So here we're focusing again on the rule choosers and seeing how they fare in the second block once the object match now becomes available as an option. And what we find is that there is this consistency, this inflexibility and in generalization strategy. We have 76% of the rule choosers in the first block staying with the rule-based generalizations in that second block. And only 9% of those original rule choosers are enticed to switch generalization strategies and choose that object match consistently. And remember, this is only 9% versus in experiment one, 76% of the people chose the object match consistently throughout the experiment. So that is a strong indication that these are inflexible strategies. So the rule and the object-based representations may not be equally available at any given moment because that availability is affected by your previous generalization strategy. And this has pretty clear implications for abstract rule learning because if you start matching things based on simple perceptual features like object-based identity, you may have difficulty in ultimately learning and generalizing that rule. So we find that adults can learn and generalize abstract rules but if you push the traditional rule learning paradigm to be a bit more realistic in the sense that object matches are also often in competition with the rule, we find that the object bias constrains whether a rule is actually generalized or not. And so this generalization strategy also seems to be inflexible. So if you fall into that object bias trap, it may be difficult to ultimately generalize based on a rule, based on abstract structure. And these findings raise some other interesting questions. So for one, what makes someone a rule chooser or an object chooser in the first place? In other words, what does the individual learner bring to the table that makes them prioritize one dimension over the other? And perhaps even even more fundamental question is which dimension, either the structure or the object identity, is actually more predictive or adaptive in a given domain or context? And are people sensitive to this balance and utility between these dimensions? We're excited to explore these questions in the future. Thank you.